Welcome back to Misunderstood. I'm your host, Rachel Yucatel. I'm sitting with my longtime friend and producer, Allison. Hi, Allison. Hi, Rach. So we decided to do a pop culture roundup today, and we picked the one and only Sarah Frazier. You may know her from her podcast, The Sarah Frazier Show. She does great clips and posts on her Instagram that I'm always laughing over because she's so creative. She's got a great background in journalism and broadcast. So you should definitely follow her and listen to her podcast for sure. But she breaks down everything that she is following in pop culture right now. You know, I woke up this morning and had to be schooled all about the Taylor Swift era and what new era we're in with the drunk poet society. What's it called? Tortured poets. Yeah, well, same But similar, very similar, yeah. Drunk, tortured, whatever. And, you know, it's like these Swifties are like nothing else, which, of course, we talk about in the episode, but I really, I, I can't get away from it. I mean, my daughter has a jar out of, you know, so that we're filling it with money so I could take her to the concert in October. And we, I just can't get away from Taylor. It's like, but I love her. I love her. Swifty don't, don't come after me. I love her, but I just can't figure out this album yet. Maybe it's so many songs. It's so much to get through. It's a lot. It's a lot. I did listen through iHeart last night. I listened to the whole thing. I was there for the listening party. And then I was there for the drop you of the were? other songs. I mean, I was in my house, but I was there, you know, Wow. Listening with the rest so you, of the Swifties. You stayed up late to, to listen to it all? Three hours earlier here. So oh, right. I didn't have to deal with that. But yeah, I mean, I'm in it. I'm in it with everyone at this point. Okay. Well, I'm excited then to see how it grows on us. And if that becomes another concert, then there are definitely songs. some songs on there that you're going to love. Okay, good. Well, there's I just, think- a, there's so many that like you can't concentrate yet on what exactly, you know, pinpoint your fave yet. You got to give it time. Right. Got it. Okay. Well, Sarah Frazier gets into all that stuff about Taylor, but then we really break down the D-Day that happened with Bravo in the last week. There were so many things, divorces, breakups, um, people getting fired. People uh, having babies. Lots yeah, of stuff. Lots, lots of stuff. Things. And then, People course, out, people in. Right. And then, of course, Bethany has her new podcast, which I know you're obsessed with. Well, I'm obsessed with her as a figure because she's just fascinating. I mean, Mm. last month she was picking out lip glosses at Target. And this month she's talking about how, you know, divorce changed her and is literally giving every dirty detail about her 10 year divorce. So it's like, I mean, yeah, I don't know that I want to hear about her traumatizing sex life with Jason. I don't think I do either, but she Mm. apparently thinks people are interested in everything she does. Yeah, um, you know, it's yes, I think that it is very interesting. She does have a huge following. People listen to all this stuff, but people, I think the takeaway is starting to be like, this might be too much info because she does have a daughter that has to listen. But doesn't she go to therapy? Like, is the podcast therapy? I, I just, that's what I'm confusing this with. Yeah, it could be her, her way of, uh, Telling her story and getting it out there. Maybe. Well, we'll 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 have to follow that and see. Yeah. But anyway, uh, we go through all the hot topics that are out right now and have a really nice conversation with Sarah of all the things that she's obsessed with and looking forward to in the future. So I think, well, actually, I know you will enjoy uh, my conversation with Sarah Frazier. How good is that music, actually? We Girl, were just intro, jamming out to it. Your intro is fire. And Thank I you. always, your roster of guests, I, I can't, like, Rob Blagojevich, I'm actually, oh. I know I know you're like, girl, really, of all the, my guests, that's the one. But do, his life was so tabloid for so long. Anyway, you have amazing I know. Guests. Well, I was going to say, my, the first thing I love about my show, of course, is the guests. The second thing I love is that intro. It's so good. I love oh, to do that. 
<laughs> yeah, it's good. Anyways, I'm so happy to have you here. People love to have this pop culture roundup because I don't really follow all the news the way I should be. So I needed to have you here today. So thank you so much for joining me. Um, and before we get into all that, though, I want to talk about you. How long have you been doing your podcast? Eight years. Incredible. And you are doing like so well. You have amazing guests. The fact that you got, I think you got an exclusive with Drake Bell, right? I did. So right after Quiet on Set um, documentary dropped, which was a couple weeks ago, and you know, that whole thing was huge because it exposed Nickelodeon's Dan Schneider, who was the producer, and then Brian Peck, who sexually assaulted Drake Bell when he was 15 and had worked with him for years, went to jail for 16 months, and then Brian gets out and is still able to work in Hollywood with kids to this day, although... I think a lot of that's changing, but yes. So right after that, I actually have a mutual friend, Drake and I have a mutual friend in common and it's, we'd, we'd been talking for a while that he wanted to come on my show. I had no idea though, that he was going to reveal what he revealed in quiet on set doc. And then he said, yeah, I'm really ready to tell my story. And so he, he did, we talked for an hour and 20 minutes and I had the first interview on that Friday after the documentary dropped. And it blew up. It went everywhere. Did that change your podcast at all? Or, I mean, obviously people knew of you already. They did. You know, it's so funny and I'm sure you experienced this, but it's like when those moments happen, you get this uh, initial bump, right? So I got asked to be a guest on a lot of people's podcasts, but I would say only half of them actually followed up and followed through. Oh, <laughs> and then you, That's I guess, interesting. Do you think right? it's because the news cycle goes so quickly? I was just talking to my producer, Allison, about this last two weeks ago. Everybody, like, their morning stood still because of the um, video that came out with Mike Shoehead and the girlfriend, right? And everyone was like, oh, shit, this is, like, terrible. The next day, like, no one was talking about it anymore. It was weird. So I, do you think right. that people just were over it after hearing a little bit about it? Yeah, I think people's attention spans are very short. And I think that they, yeah, people move on quickly. So probably if, if they can't get you that exact day to talk about it. And I get yeah. that. I mean, I'm, I'm sometimes the same way I reach out to a guest and it's like in that moment, I want them. But then a week later, you're like, well, you know, I just doesn't hit the same. So I totally understand that, but it did. Yes. I have to say, and there's been even more interest in, you know, you and I are on the podcast monetizing side. So I've been reached out to some other companies that are like, hey, what are you doing, you know, with your podcast monetization wise and all this? So it, yes, I think all these moments certainly help for sure. And I've been doing this a very long time. So it feels good when you are rewarded for your hard work. Right. And gives you more credibility. Um, Wait a yes. minute. I'm, cu I'm curious about that because I did see on your Instagram, you were talking about potentially teaching a class to anyone that wanted to sign up. Have you decided what you're going to teach? Yes. I actually already have the course, but I'm going to do, and anybody listening to this can email me. I'm going to give it away to 20 people for free because I'm sure that there are blind spots. I've been doing it for so long, you know, so I'm sure there's things that I don't even think about that someone starting a podcast is like, Hey, how do I do this? Mm -hmm. So I want to have a test group of two groups of 10. Mm -hmm. I want them to just come on. I want to do the course. And then at the end, I want them to say, well, I wish you'd answered this, or could you do more of that? And I'm, it's, and what's the, what's the arc of it? Is it how to monetize your podcast, how to start a podcast from scratch? What is it? Well, I think that's what I'll find out and really hone in on when I do okay. the test group. But yes, I think it's going to be growth and monetization because I've been in this game so long. I mean, when I started eight years ago, nobody advertised on podcasts. No one knew where to find a podcast. And now we are still in its infancy. You know, mm. people are, it's a $2 billion a year advertising industry. And I'm that's so not- I'm so glad that you're saying it's in its infancy because so many people are like, oh, you know, it's too late to start or, oh, you're, you work on a podcast. Okay. What do you really do? You know, my, I'm trying to do this for a living. Like this is my income right now. And so I want to sign up for your class because I want to, you know, obviously people come to me and they think I, you know, I've only been doing this a year. So thank God that an advertiser is even remotely thinks about advertising on my show, but I want to know how to really do it and how to get the sponsors and how to get those year contracts that really make a difference, you know, so that, I can, I love doing this. I think it's so much fun. Do you love it? I love it. And you are really good at it. And you have this incredible, I, 
I believe anybody can podcast as a side hustle and turn it into a full-time job. Mm -hmm. I am where you like, I'm just a couple years ahead of you. Cause a couple years ago I had a different couple of different jobs and I kept thinking, how do I make it a full-time income? And then over the past three years, because it is still in its infancy and we are never going back to people advertising on radio. We're hardly going back to people advertising on local television. So yeah. that money is going to go now online, YouTube, creators like yourself, myself. And you have this incredible advantage that you know these amazing people that come on your show and tell their story. That is very valuable. So you will get there. And I believe whether people have a following that you have or maybe they want, they have a business podcast. There are so many ways to monetize your show and it's only getting bigger and better and more opportunities because these advertising companies are looking for incredible talent like you. But there are some things that people don't realize. A lot of people feel like they can just sign up for a podcast company to sell them and then never check in with that company. And truly to become, to make this your full-time job, you have to be in touch with your advertisers and your ad rep a lot more than people think. And that's a huge difference disconnect for podcasters. Because a lot of podcasters aren't great on the business side or they've never, you know, they've never worked with clients on a more personal basis. But if you don't really foster that relationship and tweak your commercial and give them some added value, they are not going to sign for that year contract that you want. But a lot of people right. don't know that stuff. Right. Okay. Well, this will be really interesting. And also there's a whole, you know, social media component to it that people really have to understand. That's like a whole separate business on the side. So I hope you get into that. Yes. And you know, what I would love to suggest to you is, hmm. so I think, you know, this, I had Kathy Griffin on recently and she talked about how she has these luncheons with women or sometimes men too, that come on and just talk about certain topics. It'd be so great to have some sort of luncheon where a bunch of us get together and talk about what we've learned, the ups and downs, things that we want to share, um, contacts, whatever it is, not guest related, but contacts in the business, you know, and I think that would be so interesting to put all of our minds together and talk about all the terrible things that have happened. So they don't happen. All the great things that have happened that led to other things that could be really helpful. So next time I'm in your area, let's, let's put a lunch together. We have to do that. And I'm not sure if I'm going and you and I, I think talked like too late for this, but there was just podcast movement in LA, mm -hmm. which I wish that you had come to because I thought of you. There were so many things I think you would love and other podcasters to connect to and advertisers and AI growth. So there's actually another one coming up in August in Washington, DC. I, I'm like toying on the fence, but maybe we should go because a lot Let's of Let's go. Let's go, go and have fun. It, we'll stay in the same really hotel. Good. We'll go out at night. This could be really fun. I would love it. All right. Well, we you're do, you know better. what we could do, Sarah? We could do one of those Montana boys videos together that I'm so jealous that when I went on your Instagram this morning, I saw you did one with David Yontef. To, okay. So before we get into more yeah. stuff about pop culture, which obviously the top story is Taylor Swift this morning, but my biggest question is what the hell is going on with the Montana brothers? Why does everyone care? What is that stupid song? What do they do? I don't get it, but your video made me laugh. I probably watched it 15 times. The Luke Combs song? Yeah. Um, well, the Montana boys, I think, Kristen Cavallari really kicked that off because she's yeah. dating one of the guys that's so hot. And, you know, it really is the perfect combo. That guy owes her everything because he catapulted, she catapulted him. But, you know, there's a big, not a big age gap, but there's a, over a decade age gap. He's like 26 and she's 40 or close to 40, I think. Uh -huh. So there's that, right? There's always that, you know, stigma, even though it's ridiculous, of an older woman dating a younger man and she's divorced and she has kids. So what is she doing with this guy? Right. But she's the one that really set it off. And then he is part of these two other guys, these Montana, they call themselves the Montana boys. And they, I loved it. They were just actually on Dave Portnoy's podcast the other day who I, I like, I'm obsessed <laughs> with Dave Portnoy. So, and they were, all they have right now is a clothing line out and the clothing line, thanks to Kristen has done more amazing than they ever thought it would. And they don't think that they can do a podcast because they're three men of so few words, which is true. I mean, they were like a joke on this. <laughs> Really? What, wait, tell me everything. Was it hard to get a word like pulled out of them? This episode is proudly brought to you by Lola V, an award-winning hair care line founded by the fabulous Jennifer Aniston. Mother's Day is quickly approaching. And if you're anything like me, it could be a struggle to find the perfect gift. 
I mean, there's so many times you can just get a scented candle for someone or a bathrobe. This year, I'm gifting beauty with Lola V, the Jennifer Aniston approved hair care. If you've been listening to the podcast, you know I'm a Lola V fanatic. Their products make you feel like you have a spa inside your own home. The vegan and cruelty free hair care line works for all hair types because they take the time to formulate the naturally derived plant based ingredients and then test on a variety of heads. And here at Misunderstood, we've got a treat for you guys. For a limited time, you can get an exclusive 15% off your entire order at lolavie.com. Just use code Rachel at checkout. Please note this is a new code for this uh, brand. So just make sure that you are using Rachel, R-A-C-H-E-L at checkout. Whether you want to spoil yourself or get something for mom, look no further than Lola V. I've been using Lola V for a while now, and I cannot say enough great things about it. My hair is my favorite accessory, so I make sure to take really good care of it. And Lola V has been a huge part of that. Their products are for the shower, post-shower, every part of your getting ready routine. Personally, I'm obsessed with their signature scent. It's a mix of citrus and woody notes. It always feels fresh. My favorite products right now are the restorative shampoo and conditioner. And I absolutely love the detangling spray for my daughter. Everything feels luxurious. If you're looking to get mom on the road to some luxury, try some of Lola V's bestsellers um, and they will not disappoint. Unlock Jennifer Aniston's approved hair care at lolav.com. As our loyal listeners, you get an exclusive 15% off your entire order when you use the code Rachel at checkout. That's 15% off your entire order at L-O-L-A-V-I-E.com with promo code Rachel. Please note you can only use one promo code per order and discounts cannot be combined. After you purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about them. Please support our show and tell them we sent you. Your hair will thank you. Well, no. You know what's funny? Wait, before you answer that question, you know what's funny about them? They, They do different. So for people listening, if you don't know who they are, they do these videos with like these songs and they like lip sync it and they kind of walk one guy in front of the other and one's hotter than the other. And you kind of are like, oh, who are these guys? But then you're like, well, this is dumb because they use the same song in like 30 posts. That's what I don't understand. And then it's kind of like, well, do they have a job? I like that UPS guy that's always dancing to different music or a cowboy that's always dancing to certain songs because it's funny. Like he's at his office, but like, do they work? No, this is their job. (laughs) I know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, who wouldn't love, who wouldn't love to be known for that? I mean, how lazy is that? That's great, I guess. (laughs) But we did, so did they not even, were they not even able to answer a question on David's show? No, they did on the BFF pods. They did. Um, but they just were, you know, Brianna chicken fry and Dave were saying like, okay, what to your point, what is their point? Like, what is your end game? Yeah. And they said, they didn't think they could do a podcast. They can't sing, you know, <laughs> really are hot blockheads. They are entertaining. You could some get reality. a Calvin Klein, um, yes. a, you know, sh- uh, shoot or whatever out of that. I think mm-hmm. they could probably they could probably get that. There's going to be a 15 minutes of fame that extends for a little bit, but then they better ride that wave super quick, super quick. Yeah, and that's it. They're hot Mon- Montana boys, and now of course everybody does a spoof, right? Like, I love. Have you seen the the Georgia husbands that are like fat? They call themselves the Georgia boys, and they're like fat knockoff versions of the Montana. Oh, that's more more my type. So I'm going to have to go log on to them for sure. I like that dad bod. You do? I do. I really do. If they're too good looking, they're annoying. You know, they don't listen. I was married to one who was very good looking, 10 years younger than me. And still to this day, people were like, why would you divorce him? He's so good looking. And I'm like, dude, you know, there's a lot more that goes into a relationship than that. I like those guys with dad bods. They try really hard. They love you so much. You know what I mean? They're not going anywhere. So that's no, you're right. I I have to say that's the most, I think that is the best relationship tip ever is to find a man that really adores you. And usually that means you're the hot one and he's a little less hot. And people say to you, well, you could, yeah, you could be with someone even hotter, but to your point, it no, it seems great, but then they always they always get a ton of attention from other women you don't want. And if you have a man that just adores you, that's a little like you the one that leads, it's the best. It really is the best. Right. It's nice to feel like you're the Giselle in the relationship. That's my relationship. Have you seen my husband? He's very he's very handsome. <laughs> he's very handsome. 
I got so lucky and I, I don't even know what he should have left me years ago, but mm. he, He's very handsome. He's very cute. Everybody always says, but like, he is not, I'm sorry. He's not a Montana boy. I would say this to his face, but he is the greatest husband I could ever, I never have to worry about him. And to your point, that peace of mind is excellent. He's a very good man. Thank God he's not a Montana boy. So wait, tell us a little bit about yourself. You have a long history or career in journalism. Um, And you, you know, I was looking at some of your tapes when I was researching you. You were really good and funny. You had me like laughing and I love your energy. So can you tell me like how you got into it? Yeah. So I, I've been in broadcasting almost two decades, which is like insane to say, because I started in 2005 in DC. I went to an all women's college in um, Massachusetts, Mount Holyoke, which was a terrible decision, but uh, because mostly just because there were no men in sight, I wanted to party. And I always say the Mount Holyoke women were, they were all brilliant. And I was the dumbest one. And I always wanted to be a radio DJ or a trashy talk show host. I never wanted to be a dentist or a doctor or a lawyer. And all the women there did. They were, they were amazing women. But I was like, where are the men and where are the drinks? Like, it was just, it was really bad. So I managed my way through that. I moved to DC. I'm I'm just a hustler. So I went around to every radio station and I knocked on doors and I said, are you guys hiring? And a couple of them were hiring promotions and I worked my way up. I became an assistant producer. And there was a saying in radio, you're not in radio unless you've been fired. I, I've probably been fired from five radio jobs probably in my career. They just, they change formats. They run out of money. You know, okay. radio's dead. So I, I was sort of on the tail end of radio. So they would go bankrupt or whatever. And they'd be like, all right, Frazier, we're making cuts. So today's your last day. So, (laughs) okay, great. But I did get extremely lucky in 2007. I landed a co-hosting job on a show called The Keen Show. And from that show just went to number one with iHeartRadio. And we were syndicated in Tampa, Florida, and in Memphis, Tennessee, and Louisville, Kentucky, and Cincinnati, and Baltimore, and Washington, D.C., and Sirius XM. And that changed my life. That show changed everything for me. My financial situation, it gave me chances to do red carpets and interview celebrities. Oh, wow. So I had a seven year run. And, and what then, did you do with them? Were you doing pop culture stuff? Were you talking about news? Were you picking songs? Like what were you doing? No, we were the morning show. Okay. So if you ever listen to a zany morning show in your town, that was me. It was Kane, Sammy and Sarah. And Kane was the dad and Sammy was the 20 year old college student who was high all the time. And then I was sort of the voice of reason and it just worked. We all had chemistry together and I was on air for that with them for seven years. I left. Unfortunately, my co-host a couple years ago died of a drug overdose and alcohol overdose. It was really sad. It, 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 we were an example of how money and fame changed everybody for the worst. We, we started out as great friends, but once the money came and the fame, everybody became divided and hated each other. And, you know, I've learned over the years that rising tides lift all boats, but that was not the motto there. The motto at iHeart and hot when I was there was it's not show friendship, it's show business. And they proved that to be true. So I had to leave and move on. And I moved to Fox 5 DC. I did a TV gig there with as an entertainment correspondent and correspondent and a, a true crime journalist. I did true crime podcasts for a while. I always have done like comedy things, improv, stand-up stuff. I worked another radio gig in between, but then my last radio job, I got a severance package and I knew radio was dead and podcasting was the future. And so I took the money and I started my show. Wow. And so, how you know, it's really important, in my opinion, correct me if I'm wrong, to find somewhat of a niche or like a brand, you know, because a lot of people are always talking to me, oh, I'm going to start a podcast. And I'm like, about what? And they, you know, oh, I'm going to talk about the news or my life or, you know, like Bethany keeps starting new podcasts, talking about her divorce, whatever. So everyone has something to talk about, but I think it's really important to find your niche, to be able to stand out and also to have it have some longevity to it. Do you agree with that? Yeah, 100%. I do tell people when you start your show, if you've always had this desire to tell your story or to have a podcast, just do it. And don't worry about the niche at first because mm-hmm. most people quit. You know, most people never get as far as you've gotten as, as that I've gotten. Most people will do it for six months and they realize, as you know, it's a ton more work, right? It's yeah, so much more than you think. Research, even doing research for guests is a heavy lift, you know? Oh, yeah. 
So I always say to people at first, just get your reps in, just commit to, if you're going to put your show out on Wednesdays, just do it. But to your point to actually really make money. Yes. You have to become known for something. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And that's actually hard for people to know what they're, what they want to, you know, focus on and and be driven about. Okay. So when you first started, what did you know you wanted to talk about on your podcast? Well, I mean, to your point, I actually, when I started the Sarah Fraser show, I had no idea. I did it three days a week at a comedy club in DC at the DC improv. I will forever be grateful for them. And I didn't, I had no idea. I did everything. I I went to a, I broadcasted from a mosque to find out more about what it was like to be a Muslim woman and and in a Muslim community in Virginia. I had a oh my god, I'm trying to think. I've had everybody on my show. I, I did Black Lives Matter things. I did comedy stuff. We did an election night party when it was Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump and you oh, know how people- fun. So you basically were <laughs> almost like a variety show where you would cover completely all sorts of things. Yeah. And Incidentally, have you ever gone into an Amish community to get to the bottom of what's going on in there? No, but that would be a good one. Maybe we could do that together because I, I am dying to know what's happening. Same thing with Scientology. I want to go in. I want to say, no. you can't change me and see if they can. Okay. Well, I, I would definitely join a call. So I know they would change me. Here's what I always say. I would be a Scientologist until I would join any call until the part where you have to give them money. <laughs> I am like, like, I hate that. Make me famous first. And then I will give you my money. I'm not doing this, that hundred thousand dollar audit for Scientology to get to the, yeah. no, you bring me to the next level. And then I will get, it's like, should be like a manager. Once they yeah. make you famous, here's 20%. I'm not giving you 20% beforehand. But you know, that's what Scientology, you got to pay to be audited. No, thank you. I know you're right. And they're out there like washing dishes as like a famous actor kind of. It's terrible. Yeah. And that Sea Org where you have to go out and work like, you know, you're a slave to him. I don't think so. You make me Tom Cruise's equal. And then absolutely, I will clean toilets for you and everything else. But it doesn't work the other way. No, thanks. It actually would be funny if the two of us went in because I feel like they can't, you know, get get me and they can get you. But the whole point would be we want to find Terry Miscavige. You know, the the guy's wife that's been missing. Where is she? Northern Cal. She's in Northern California. I've got a podcast for you. Actually, she this woman's a good podcast guest for you. Did, did you ever watch the LuLaRoe documentary that was about the LuLaRoe leggings multi-level marketing scheme? No. Do oh. I need to? Yeah, you'd love it. This is so oh, you. It down. So the woman that is the main character in this, she, she was a victim of the MLM, of the couple that started LuLaRoe. She okay. now has a podcast solely dedicated to exposing multi-level marketing schemes and, and the damage that they do to people that, that are on the tight, you know, the lower level, because you have to buy in so much money and then you lose it. You can, you're never going to sell your leggings. She is now investigating Scientology and she located, I actually think, I don't know if she drove up there herself or if I think maybe it was another podcast, true crime podcast, but apparently Sheila lives, that's her name, right? Isn't it? Or Shelly. No, sorry. It's Shelly. Shelly, yeah. Shelly lives in Northern California on I a mountain. Terry. You're right. It's Shelly. Shelly Miscavige. And yeah. she is, I, apparently there's like security at the gate, at this gated hilltop home. It's all Scientologists. And supposedly that is where she is. Yeah. But has someone really seen her? Because wouldn't that have been like on the cover of People? <laughs> This is the house where Shelly, to your point, no, I don't think anyone's physically seen her. I think they, they were able to track her down by, she voted a few years ago in the state of California. Oh, come on, Sarah, you know, there's voter fraud out there. (laughs) I'm I'm curious if she was a Trump fan or a Biden fan. I bet they're Trump fans. Don't you think? I mean... Who knows? I'm not going to go down that road, I guess. Um, All right. Let's get into some hot topics. You covered a lot of really good um, things recently, but today everyone is talking about Taylor Swift. Are you a Taylor Swift fan? I'm a new fan. I went to the Eras tour. I did. And uh, now I'm a fan. I was never, I never got it. Have you been to her concert? Have you been to? I have. I went broke doing it, but I did do it. And my daughter constantly talks to me about, she gives me PowerPoints on why we need to go again in Miami in October. 
I know every price, every seat, every location of this Miami theater because she brings it up so many times. And by the way, she stayed up all night listening or waiting for the 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 album to drop or whatever. Orchard Poet. Yeah. yeah. Fell asleep like five minutes before. And she woke up in the middle of the night in a, in a cold sweat, so upset that she missed the release. And on the way to school this morning, we were listening to it. And I'm like, these songs don't sound so great, Wyatt. What do you think? And she turned into a pterodactyl and was like, how could you talk like that? This is her best album ever. So anyways, Swifties are Swifties. And um, did you see what David Portnoy, speaking of him earlier, did you see what he posted this morning? Yes, I loved it. You and I both liked it. Basically, there's a song because it's a double album. It was released at 2 a.m. this morning, Tortured Poets Department. And one of the songs is Thank You, Amy. But the, it, at the end of Thank You or Thanks, K is capitalized. And in Amy, it's A-I-M. So people are equating it to Kim. Mm -hmm. And in the track, it says, I know your kids are going to be listening to this forever, you snake. But it doesn't say that. But it says essentially like your kids something are like that. something like that. Your kids are going to be singing this song forever. And I love it. Dave Pornay came on and he was like, Kim, you're just scum and we'll never forget. Right. And he essentially they were doing like a lock her up chant for, for Kim Kardashian this morning based on David Portnoy's assessment of the whole thing, which is hysterical. All right. But what do you think? Because you've been in, you know, you've been in high profile conversations. Do you think it's getting a little desperate that Taylor is still because this is a decade old or getting close to a decade old feud when they release that. Well, I'll be, I'll be honest with you. I still am upset about something that happened to me in eighth grade with my friends. I remember everything that happened. I remember her name and I still don't like her to this day because of it. So I get that. Um, but I also will say that Taylor strikes me as being a little bit immature. I'm not saying this in a bad way. I mean, she's young. So she strikes me as being, um, you know, she's had to be so mature in so many ways and her lyrics are becoming more mature and she's, but she's used to this, like in all the songs we've heard in the past, it's, it's very like high school love. Do you know what I mean? So I feel like inside of her head, she might be a little more, um, you know, like stuck in the past. So it doesn't strike me that she would be stuck in the past with that. But also a lot of her songs are about people and things that have happened to her and things that have like, you know, made her write songs. So I get it. I think it's normal. And I think it's fun for the people that are following this to like, you know, feud about it. And is it about this boyfriend? Is it about um, Travis? Is it about, you know, all these different things. So I don't know. I love it. I think it's part of her brand and I think it's fine. Okay. You, I, what do you think? Uh, I'm beginning you, like get over it. I, I'm a little, it's like a little desperate to me. I don't know. I'm just saying like it, 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 to me, it feels as though we didn't want to put a Travis song on there. Although maybe, I mean, cause I haven't had a chance to listen to all the songs. I mean, I think saying I'm alchemy is about Travis. Oh, it's about him. Okay. Yeah. Because she has a lot of football references and touchdown and all that kind of stuff. So we'll have to listen later today and we should have my daughter on to really break it down, but she's at school. <laughs> she would know. She would know because I'm like, is this sort of avoiding Travis? So we're going back for this decade old few. I mean, that's a long time ago for that tape. Right. But, you know, as our friend Dave Portnoy said, Taylor did have to go into hiding for an entire year because right. of so much backlash and scrutiny. So you make a good point. That's not something that most people, anyone is probably going to just get over. That takes a long time. Yeah. I mean, remember right. when Kanye stood up on stage and took her uh, award away from her and said it went to Beyonce? I mean, that whole thing of Kanye and Kim together. I just think that probably is so like in her bones and she's probably, it probably has not left her um, psyche at all. So it, it, you know, yeah, she should get over it, but I think it makes the album more exciting for, you know, the Swifties to listen to and no, take I, a side. they always take a side, right? Oh God. Yeah. They're and they're totally team Taylor on this. So yeah. I take it back now. All right. Now I feel like, okay, you know what? She's still got, it's still got some legs in it. Right. Um, okay. So a lot of stuff happened in the Bravo world in the last week or so. So I wanted to talk to you about, because you cover so much Bravo and I wanted you to kind of break a lot of this stuff down. So I think, first of all, it started with a lot of people being let go. We had Anne Marie first, then we had Crystal. Um, then we had someone else, uh, Robin Dixon. Like, what are your thoughts on all these people getting let go? And then also there's the, um, rumored, um, the rumors that Rebecca Minkoff is now on, on Roni. So like uh, people being let go and new people coming on, what are your thoughts? 
Okay, so we had a Bravo D Day recently. I mean, it was, a, a, I can't recall another day in Bravo history where you had so much going on. And yeah. then Candace Dillard Bassett, who already had announced her exit, announces that she's pregnant, right? 13 or 14 weeks pregnant. It was a huge day. Uh, I make of it this Robin Dixon needed to go. I really liked Robin. You know, I spent most of my career in DC, so I know all these women. I'm so thrilled. Because Potomac is the only reality show ever to be successful in the D.C. area. It's not a reality TV town. You know this from high-profile people and men. People are very high-profile, very rich. They're very powerful. They don't want to be on camera. It's a very hard town to find talent. So I, I loved that this show happened. But Robin, whatever really did go down with Robin and Juan and that cheating scandal, we will never know. What? Yeah. Whatever is out there, that is all Robin's going to give us. So there's nothing left. She had to go. Glad to, you know, happy to see Robin go. We needed to break up Robin and Giselle. I think Neck will be fired next. That was also the rumor on Monday. I don't see how Neck, maybe Neck survives. Maybe it's a Crystal Minkoff situation where they kind of need this sort of neutral-ish person. But I wouldn't miss her if she were gone. Okay. Um, Super happy about Candace being pregnant. Congrats to her. I think she has a career outside of Bravo. So I think she will go on to do amazing things, acting, singing. I think she's all good. Uh, I've I've been on the fence where I thought Real Housewives of Potomac would be canceled, but I do think it will continue probably with the cast that they have. They'll look for a couple other people and see how this next season goes. So I say it survives. I'm curious. Do you know what the lowest rated Housewives show is? Oh, God, Miami. I don't think anybody watched Miami. I don't even know that Miami got 900,000 views. Okay, so we're going to get to Miami in one second. But I'm curious, did you ever watch The Housewives of D.C.? when It it was only on one season, and now it's out in this big vault that was released on Peacock, which is very interesting. Yes. And in fact, Paul Wharton, who appeared as a friend on that season, used to co-host the Sarah Fraser show for about a year. So. Paul was great. He knew he knew all the women and Sharice was on, came on our show. Yes, I and I loved the Salahis. Oh, my God. I thought they were so great. Uh, I really liked that season, but that it didn't do well. And 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 it also didn't do well because the feds got involved because of because of them and uh, Tarek. And, um, you know, he's actually a friend of mine. He's going to do the show, I think, coming up soon. He lives near me and we go out to dinner once in a while. And he is now in a completely different world, married to a new person, you know, is heavily involved in the polo lifestyle. So it'll be interesting. I just spoke to him today and I asked him if he would come on. So he's going to come on next week. So I'm excited for that. Um, What a juicy. Yeah, that would be a good one. Yeah, but I thought that was a good one. You know, I've never watched Potomac, um, but I, you know, it, it seems like a lot of people do like it. It was great several seasons ago when you had Monique and you had Candace, and I think Giselle and Robin were, maybe we just were less used to their antics, I guess. It, it was mm. good, but I do think they're struggling for sure to find, you know, it's it's hard. It's hard right to find now. a Kyle Richards. You know, it's hard to find an Erica Jane, right? Where her story transcends even pop culture. Yeah. You know, I mean, Tom Girardi was such a huge attorney here in LA. And and I mean, then he was a part of the famous Aaron Brockovich movie that Julia yeah. Roberts wins an Oscar for. I mean, it's hard to find these people that sort of transcend pop culture. But Potomac needs that, I think. Right. Okay. So let's talk about Miami because you brought it up. Um, Alexia's divorce. Do you care? Were you shocked? Were you as shocked as Alexia? <laughs> I know she was. I, and I actually just read that she made another statement. She's so thrilled that fans are on her side with the whole Todd divorce and that she was warned by a friend, but didn't take it seriously and thought they'd work it out. Um, well, first of all, I'm not a fan of RHOM. I actually find that to be the least interesting franchise. Okay. Uh, You know, I've heard mixed things that Alexia knew well in advance this was coming, but I'm, you know, I'm sure it's devastating. I don't know her. I don't follow their storyline specifically. So I have to. So I think any divorce would be devastating. So that is one that I watched probably because I live in Florida. So I thought I'd start watching, but I only started this past season and, you know, it was hard to watch um, Lisa. It was hard to watch her constantly talk about her divorce from Lenny while she had some other boyfriend in every scene with her. It was like this poor guy. 
I didn't understand why he was sticking around with her when all she did was cry and talk about her divorce from Lenny. And it seemed a little pathetic to me. Um, but I found the characters, you know, I, I don't know. Some of them were really interesting. I think Gertie's kind of interesting, obviously what she's going through, what she went through on the show, um, opening up about that. And I'll be honest with you. I'm kind of obsessed with the whole Larsa and Marcus thing because they were on traders. So I like them. And I like her, but I just think I wish she could acknowledge how weird it is that she's dating Michael Jordan's son. Just, I think it would be funnier if she was like, yeah, that's so fucked up, right? Like, oh my God, he must be thinking of us at night having sex. Like, it's too weird. You know, whatever. But like, she makes it seem like, what's the big deal? No one talks about anyone else's, um, you know, father. But it's like, she's not dating, dating you know, some guy who, who works at the gas station. I mean, like, we, and, and the dad is like a nobody. Like, that's terrible for her to like, not be connecting about that. Yeah, I know. I should get more into it because I do enjoy the Larsa and Marcus. Yeah. Saga. And speaking of podcasts, they had a very short lived podcast that only lasted like eight episodes and then they yeah. stopped. I didn't listen. I don't know what they could be talking about much. Um, it, but... Well, clearly they didn't know either because it couldn't get. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, to be fair, I mean, there are two people that probably have a lot of money, so they're probably not that interested. Like, what incentive do they have to keep this going? Um, right. What is but, your favorite Bravo show? Oh, Beverly Hills. I mean, I just, yeah. I love it. And I loved this past season of Salt Lake. I loved it. I'm I'm so sad to see Von Teese leave. I just feel like she was yeah. great. You know, I just feel like the casting is so strange because you would have thought that they would have almost forced her to be back on because it makes for such great TV. And that's what people want to hear. I don't think we're, was anyone watching Salt Lake before that. I mean, I guess they were because of the whole what's what's her name that went to ben prison. Shaw. That yeah, was that was kind of interesting, too. But like, I think that it made this season really good. Uh, it made it so great. It made it must watch TV. Must yeah. watch. Right. I don't know. There's going to be some reason that she isn't back. I don't know if the whole story that the producers really didn't know that she was a part of this, but maybe that is true. And then they yeah. feel a bit duped or that they need to cool things off. I always feel like maybe all the other women got together and told Bravo us or her. I and agree. So it's like, well, are we going to recast? You know, I mean, there is, there is strength in numbers. So mm -hmm. if they all went to Bravo and they were like, look, we're 100% not resigning. If you, put her on. I, I don't know. I mean, that, that would have been yeah. something, but no, I, I get it. I think you're right. And I think, and I do think that's what happened. Were you upset? You said you like, um, Beverly Hills. Were you upset about Crystal and Anne Marie? Uh, no, I would have kept Anne Marie and I never thought Crystal brought anything anyway. Really? So it's interesting, but don't you feel like it was so evident she was trying so hard this season to have a storyline and a, and a voice and be this angry woman and stand up for herself. So I actually th was shocked when they, you know, when she said she was leaving because I thought, oh, she really showed up exactly how they wanted her to. And Anne Marie, you know, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't really know what to think of her. I didn't think she was terrible, but I didn't think she really stood out either. Well, Anne Marie sort of got you know, Anne Marie's whole situation got derailed because the husband, uh, Marcus, has been accused of, or Marcellus, sorry, has been accused of sexual assault back when he was at Columbia by a, a former student there. And so that dropped weeks before the premiere. And a lot of people feel as though Bravo scrambled a bit to edit out. Because, you know, if you think about it, we never really saw them interacting a lot as a family. It was almost like one family scene Anne Marie was introduced and then that was it. You know, you didn't get a lot of character building and a lot of people feel like that's because they had to edit him out. They want they didn't want a lot of controversy and stink around yeah. that couple. So, I I you know, it's funny. She didn't bother me as much as other people. I actually liked her. I really like when super intelligent women are on and she certainly is, even though yeah. she's not a doctor of anesthesiology. She's an a nurse of anesthesiology. You know, she's a smart cookie. Like I like a woman like that. And you know, to be fair to Crystal, maybe we just never saw that side of Crystal. Apparently Crystal owns a cocoa water company that's does enormous. I just don't recall them ever really. Maybe she's a fantastic businesswoman, but we never saw that with Crystal. You always saw Crystal just I to me she just jumped on the bandwagon of anything, any line she could get except for her yeah. own. So Right, right. Does anyone care about her brother? Like if her brother's getting married or if she's meddling in her brother? Like, no. No. 
Terrible. Yeah. Super boring. Um, do you care about Real Housewives of New York? Do you care about the the um, rumor that Rebecca Minkoff is on? Yes. I love it. I think you it's do. great. Yes. Oh. Okay. I don't do understand. You... I don't understand why she's already getting this hate just because she's a Scientologist. And people are saying, well, she was very close to Danny Masterson. Okay. Well, is she still close? If she's still close to him and she doesn't believe that he really raped a woman, then there, that's a problem. But have we heard that yet? We'll but... have to hear her side. That Maybe that's what makes her interesting. Right? I mean, this is, this is just so stupid internet hate. It's like people already... Is every Scientologist evil? I mean, I'm a Catholic. You know how many Catholics like help helped cover up these priests molesting kids? Is that right. should they never be on a TV show because I'm Catholic? Like, let the woman have a fucking moment. It's crazy. It, like, it's just what drives me nuts about some po- Bravo podcasters and just the internet in general. It's like yeah. give her give her a B. There's horrible people in every religion. So yeah. we're not gonna have anybody on that's part of a religion. Like, that's so stupid. Absolutely true. Um, speaking about uh, podcasters in the Bravo world, Bethany Frankel, we brought up earlier, um, is in the news today for talking about her new podcast, which is all about her divorce, um, her sex with her ex-husband, Jason, as equivalent as torture. What are your thoughts on, first of all, does she have to have a podcast for every avenue of what she wants to talk about and it, do you think she's just a total hustler and is doing this because it's such a money maker and she's getting ads for each one separately and it just is she all she cares about is her bank account or like don't you think she would have had to sign an nda with jason like i just feel like this is so weird and also i have a kid her age i definitely don't need to be airing my dirty laundry about my sex life with the father of my kid i just think it's sort of strange what do you think um, I'm completely with you. And uh, you talk about, I don't even think she needs the money. I think she is so desperate for attention, anything for attention. I look, Bethany, there's two, th- I'm not a Bethany fan at all whatsoever. And every time I talk about her, I get Bethany stands that give me one star reviews on my podcast. And I don't <laughs> give a shit. You, you're welcome to go do it. I don't get you. You all mistake me for someone who cares. Um, Bethany is genius in two realms. One, if reality reckoning is such a great idea. But if Bethany was true to that, she'd be reaching out to other people from TLC. I do a lot of stuff with TLC. You want to talk about underpaid? So many of their talent. Underpaid, no benefits, no 401k, nothing. They end up having to try to make all their money off Cameo. She hasn't, you haven't seen her parade one TLC person out. What about VH1? What about MTV? People that spent years. Why aren't they telling their story on her podcast? She doesn't care. This is a personal vendetta against Bravo and Andy. So that's a shame because I think she was actually on to something. And two, I've always, Bethany should have a show that is just Bethany and it's almost like Bar Rescue where she goes to businesses. If she's such a terrific businesswoman, which she claims to have to be, she should be going and going into a business and going, you're doing that, opening their books, going, you're doing this wrong, you're doing that. Like, wouldn't you want, almost like a Tabitha, remember that show with Tabitha where she went into salons and yeah. redid, okay, It would be so epic, but I don't think Bethany, Bethany doesn't care about other people. It's about, has to be about Bethany. That is why we are now getting just be divorced. And I refuse to listen. I'm listening to Tori Spelling's misspelling because I actually find that more fascinating, but Bethany will drudge up anything, anything. And it's just sad because she was such a huge talent, but I don't, I don't see how you can follow her now. Wait a minute. Um, I didn't know about Tori Spelling. Is she talking about why she lives in a trailer? It is treat yourself to a weekend and Tori's brilliant. The episodes are like 27 minutes, sweet spot. It's so good. And it is all about, she, it's just, she goes to her storage units, which by the way, she couldn't pay the bills. So they were getting ready to do like a storage war where they were going to auction them off. And then it it did. Yeah. At a time in my life where I could not pay my bills, they auctioned off all my stuff. It's, oh my God. It's, was anything super terrible. valuable in there? Yeah. This is a very long time ago, but it was devastating. But, you know, it also makes you have to start brand new. But I still think about it to this day because I'm like, oh, shit, that table would have looked amazing in here. Like, I'm still not over it. Like, we were talking about the Taylor Swift thing and Kim Kardashian. I'm not over it. I, har- I harbor a lot of resentment about a lot of things that happened to me. Sorry, I digress. Go on. <laughs> Actually, I kind of want to hear more about that. No, it, it's a good learning lesson, right? Like, it it puts your whole life in perspective. Yeah. She, I, so I she love goes it. goes to her storage units and does what? Goes through them? She cut, They cut open the locks because a friend paid the bill. And it's actually so sad. What's inside? She's like, she is storing 
Um, oh my God, old papers. And I'm not even kidding you, like dis- like Lysol disinfectant spray. And she's like, I I should have lost these storage. I should have, I should have given them up. She, she goes, I can't believe I was storing, I'm sort of a borderline hoarder. And then she goes into how she, you know, her mom has not really helped her, even though they've had hundreds of millions of dollars. And she just never had any perspective on money. And even though she's in her 50s, it's kind of her Achilles heel. Like she sucks with money. And to this day, the hardest part for her to wrap her head around is that she's just not like super famous and her dad's not here to give her money. It's like, and on the surface, you think, God, this is so superficial. Like people have real problems, but you know, we're all just, you're all just victims of your own environment. So for her, that is the, that's her ultimate low. Because, yeah, Yeah. I grew up in this, I mean, how many, what what was it, like 45,000 square foot mansion in Beverly Hills, and you had drivers and chefs, and then, you know, he dies, he gives you one. And she said when she was doing 90210, all her castmates had investment advisors, they bought homes, they bought a second house to invest, and she was like, I'm not doing that shit, why would I do that? I'm I'm like a trust. I thought she didn't need to. But what is the drama between her and her mom? Like, why did the dad leave the money to the mom thinking she'll she'll take care of Tori? And the, isn't there a brother, too? Yeah, he's and amazing. Did, he's like a spiritual he, counselor now. Did they leave him any money? Did the dad leave him any money or does the mom support him? Aaron Spelling famously left both Tori and her brother just one million dollars each. And then the rest of the mon- money went to Candy. And I don't know. I I've. I, I don't, I think they are very both quiet, meaning Tori and Candy. I think they're very quiet about their relationship. But that's like the whole thing. It's like, how could this woman let her daughter with 11 and a half kids and farm animals live in a trailer? I mean, it's so bizarre to me. I mean, first of all, my mom would do that too. So I get it. But, um, you know, I just think because it's so public, you would think that she would at least just buy her a fucking house by now. I mean, it could be $500,000. Just buy her something. I feel bad for her. I'd love to talk to her. I think she's very interesting. And what do you mean she thinks she's not very famous? If you, anyone, who doesn't know the name Tori Spelling? I think everyone knows who she is, no? Or maybe she hasn't done anything in years. I think, no, I think you're right. I think she is famous. But I think the, you know, she talks about, which is true. I live in Los Angeles. She talks about, look, I have five kids in the most expensive state in the yeah. country. What am I doing? And and I think probably because she's divorcing Dean, she can't just move to another state. Because oh, I yeah. listen to the podcast and I like speak to her while I'm doing I'm like, girl, move to Arizona where it's tax friendly. Yeah. But she probably can't do that because of Dean. The kids have their friends here. But I will say in defense of Candy, there was a story that came out this week that Candy is now apparently helping her financially. So I I think, I don't know if that's true, but I feel like it was a legitimate um, outlet. I can't remember if it was people, but they caught up with Candy Spelling and she said, yes, I am helping Tori financially. So that could mean she's paying the gas of the, of the trailer. I mean, we don't know. Or maybe just, you know, maybe she's just paying for the grandkids, like the grandkids, but Tori's got to figure out everything out. Yeah. So. Well, okay. It remains to be seen, but I, I'm kind of obsessed with that story and I'm obsessed with her and, you know, her, her other friend, Shannon, um, it's heartbreaking watching her go through her struggle with, um, cancer. Have you been watching that? She has her own podcast out now, which do you listen to that? No, I haven't listened to it much, but it, yeah, Shannon breaks my heart. It's just, Oh, it's so hard to hear, but I, I'm, I think Shannon's amazing because to share your journey every step of the way inspires other people, helps other people talk about it. Hopefully we get a freaking cure for this damn cancer that so many young people are getting. And it's incredible how many young people are getting it. It's so scary. It's so sad. It's just, you would think at this point they would be able to come up with something. They were able to figure out how to curb HIV, like, you know, so you would think by now, hopefully soon, it's just terrible. I don't even want to talk about it actually. So, um, isn't it hard? I think that's with Shannon. It's like, you know, you know, it's my dad died of esophageal and stomach cancer years ago when I was in high school. My mom has beat cancer twice. She's, she's had breast cancer and she had kidney cancer two years ago. She had her kidney removed. Thank God we've caught it early. Um, but I hate it. I, I think because I live with it so much, it's like, I just can't listen to it because, uh, I just want to keep my head in the sand and I hear you. I totally understand. All right. Well then let's move on. 
So I want to know briefly before we end here. So uh, what are the things on your radar? Like, what are you following? And I know you do a lot of like sister wife stuff and uh, all that. So what are the things you're obsessed with right now? Well, now I'm obsessed with the show Seeking Sister Wife. Mm-hmm. And tonight, Love After Lockup. I'm going to be watching Love After Lockup for the very first time on Love WeTV, it. which has Love a new it. season. And that's all about people that fall in love with someone in jail. And then the mm-hmm. person is getting out and they try to navigate their lives. And of course, most of it's extremely disastrous. So I can't wait. I'm a first time viewer to that. But mm-hmm. Seeking Sister Wife, I've watched. It's in its fifth season. It, I mean, it's. You can't even make it up. And I enjoy these couples so much. They're all seeking. And the women are, for the most part, are at, like leading the charge. They are all looking to add a, another wife to the group. And it is. Why? <laughs> Why? Why? Isn't one hard enough? I don't get it. So my husband says, he's like, are you, are, are you kidding? I have all I can do to handle you. You want to bring another woman in here? This is bananas. Uh, oh, so it's, all, not about, it's not just about threesomes. It's about a relationship and a, a, the whole thing. Many believe it's a religious calling. So one couple that people hate the most are named Garrick and Danielle. And they both come together and they say years ago, do I believe the Holy Spirit had this time on his hands? I do not. But they claim the Holy Spirit visited them and told them they were supposed to bring on a third wife. Now, do you think of all the things in the world that the Holy Spirit and Christ have to do? They talk to them about bringing in another wife. Hell no. You are so full of it. Like, I mean, isn't Christ busy? And you think they he stopped to tell them to get a third wife? Fuck off. That's hysterical. So, they, yeah, but that's what they, they always go. The Holy Spirit spoke to us. So he is now on a mission. He found a woman in Brazil. Danielle divorced him. They were legally married, divorced him in the state of Colorado so he can marry this woman from Brazil, Natalia, and bring her here and she can be their third. So it could be the three of them. Okay. So we'll see how that happens. Um, and what goes on with that. That's very interesting. Now, I, I, I'm very open on my podcast about how I'm in the dating, you know, trying to find the one. So, you know, I love shows like this because it always gives me hope. I'm like, maybe I should get involved with that, kind, you know, polygamy. Maybe I should, maybe I should start writing letters to men in, in jails. Like, hello, oh. the Menendez brothers married like a couple times. I actually tried to get the wife on my show. She hasn't responded yet, but I find it fascinating. I want to do an episode on what it's like to fall in love with somebody in jail and how you make that work. Um, I had a funny conversation. I'm trying to think if I can say with who who it was. I guess I can. It was with Michael Lohan and he was talking about, he was just here visiting. Um, and I was talking to him about what it was like when he was in prison years ago. We're talking about in the eighties. Okay. Eighties and nineties, whatever it was. And he was talking about how he would get conjugal visits with Dina and they would have sex all over the prison. I was like, how did that happen? That seems like he's like, Oh, we would go into the area where the pastor does the church thing. We'd have sex there. And as soon as I got out of prison, we had sex like five times in the car and like in the, in the, you know, we stopped at a, um, at a motel to have sex. What are you saying? I found it very interesting. So it creates like a big sex drive for you. I think it's kind of sexy, no? Oh my God. Yeah, I think it is. I think there is something about just hot jail bait that, you know, yes, gets people going. I think you should cast a wide net. Yes, you should reach out to the men in jail. I mean, I don't know. I think think I'd rather be in a polygamous relationship than jail. I'm just like, I don't know, white collar crime, I guess though. That's fine. So- Maybe. All right. Maybe some of the guys in jail, but you know, no hardcore, you know what I'm saying? No, fa- like, no, but they're so fit. They're so fit. Those guys in jail. Cause that's all they have to do. Right. I mean, work oh, out so many hot guys in jail, Yeah, um, such a but shame. yeah, the polygamy, you'd be on a reality show in a heartbeat or as a polygamous <laughs> wife. Epic. I'm still dying to be on love is blind. I still think that's such a good show. Do you watch it? Yeah, I do. You'd be great on that too. They should do one for older people, you know, because everyone on it is 20 in their 20s and they don't have a job. I've never understood why they don't cast people with a real job, because someone with money is going to do better than someone who makes like $12 an hour and you have to go live with them in their studio apartment. It doesn't make any sense. You know, like they should cast it slightly better. Um, All right. Are there any other shows you're watching or things you want us to be aware of that are hot topics on your mind? Um, I just watched, let me get the accurate title. Did you watch on Hulu, the documentary about the fake handbag business? And, um, oh, I love it. I'm ordering a bunch of fake bags and now carrying a fake Chanel or a fake Dior is the shadow world of counterfeit purses. 
super fakes. I was addicted to this show. <laughs> and you have to go on Reddit. And then you have to go on this. I, I got to get on Reddit. And you've got to go to this one link. And you ask for this woman, Linda, in China. And she will connect you with somebody else that's independent. And then you order these fakes. And then basically what they did on this Hulu special was they brought in experts and they were like, okay, tell us which one was real and which one was fake. And it like takes them a hot second. Hermes bags, all this stuff. I'm like, okay. Can we get Linda's number? Yes, I will find Linda's number for us. And they said 15, 20 years ago, because I can remember my, uh, my, I, I have the sweetest gunkles. One Christmas, they were so excited and they came to my house and they had, they had purchased a bunch of fake Louis Vuitton bags down on Canal Street. And they were yeah. so, they were like, guess what? You're going to be decked out in Louis Vuitton. Oh my All God. fake. <laughs> but I had never had the heart. I was like, yes, thank you so much. But of course, you remember like 20 years ago, you would never carry, you'd never be caught dead with a fake. It'd be so embarrassing. Oh yeah. But this documentary now talks about how all these women like are openly sharing, like, this is fake, this is fake. And like, I'm saving all this money and I'm investing and this is a fake and how now it's this badge of honor. And also they've gotten so good at counterfeiting them that it's almost like, do you want to buy the real thing? Yeah. Well, it is a waste of money. I mean, I was in Paris over Christmas and I, you know, of course I went to all the stores and went shopping. It is so expensive to get these bags now. I mean, I was looking at a dog bag, okay. At Goyard. I mean, of course, very ridiculous, rich people problem stuff. It was so outrageously expensive, but it was so gorgeous. I didn't, I didn't get it. But then I found out that you could get these online for, you know, for, a fraction of the cost. I mean, it still isn't that inexpensive. It was like $700 or something, but as opposed to 5,000 was like, okay, that makes sense. Um, yeah, it's, it's very, it's a fascinating world. I'll have to look that up. Um, do you have any other interesting people coming on your show? Who's coming up? Um, a lot. Well, Carlos King, who has reality with the King podcast, he's going to be on Mm -hmm. soon. Um, I've got a dating expert that is coming up on Monday and I'm trying to think of who else I'm working on. There's some other TikTok people that really fascinate me that I'm, I'm working on, but, um, no, I've, I've sort of had like a bit of a lull in guests and, I've cover a lot to your, you said this before, sister wives, and there's a lot going on with that show because unfortunately they're a polygamous family. They have 18 kids. One of their sons took his own life a couple of months ago. And so there's a lot of discussion of if this show is going to continue. So I'm sort of wrapped up in that. Um, but no, I always, you know, I'm always looking for that fascinating guest. Yeah. Do you have a, um, like a bucket list of someone who you really want to have on? Sandra Bullock is my dream. Giselle Bunchen, who I need to reach out to because she just did a Nourish book. So now is the time. Um, I, I, okay, who else? Oh, um, actually, I watched the Patriots documentary, so now I'm less interested. But Bill Belichick used to be one of my dream guests because I wanted Bill to come on and talk about everything aside from football. But I actually think it would be the most awful interview of uh, all time. I don't think he has anything else to say. So yeah, probably not. <laughs> I had the guy, it, I actually have the book right here that the show was based on. It's called The Dynasty. And I had the author on um, to talk all about what it was like to make that book and interact with all those people. So I haven't watched the documentary much yet, but I I finished the book. The book is extraordinary. I should actually send it to you. Um, I think you would like it. I and would I'm lo- not even a football fan. It was just such a good book about the people involved and the stories. I have so many dream guests. Oh my God. Dave Portnoy is a dream guest. Have you, uh, isn't he amazing? I love Dave. I love, I love that Dave is unapologetically Dave. I just, I'm obsessed. I want more women to behave like Dave. (laughs) I know, you know, I really love him. I wish that he wasn't so obsessed with people that were like 20 because he only hangs out with like 25 year olds, you know? Cause I'm over here and I'd love to hang out with him, but, um, no, I think he's so great. I love that. He, you know, I love the whole thing with Miss Peaches and, you know, he can't speak with a normal voice when he's around her. I think it's super cute. Um, you know, it's always this high pitched Miss Peaches and hearing his little giggle is so cute. So I, I think people are definitely starting to like him more and more, especially because of, um, the rescuing of the pit bull and, and I have two pit bulls, so I appreciate that. Um, and they're both rescued. But also because of, you know, his rant this morning about like we spoke about with with Taylor Swift. So but wait, I want to go back to Sister Wise for one second. I'm ah. not going to say who I'll tell you off air, but I have a, an exclusive coming up in um, a couple of weeks with one of the main people from the Sister Wives. So you're going to have to fill me in on all the details with that. But 
Um, yeah, I think I think that it is very interesting what's been going on with that show. And I I really don't understand it. I mean, I'm not having them come on to talk about the show per se. I'm having them to come on to talk about the reality of that life. It's fascinating. And it's fascinating how they've all gone their separate ways. And I my biggest question is, how the hell does he support all these kids? What does he do? Do you what you must know? Oh yeah, well Cody Brown um has always been in firearms. So you never really see what he um does, not because he's doing anything illegal, but because obviously I think even though guns are legal in this country, people have very hot takes on if you are a gun dealer. Now, one of the things that people are get upset about is he often goes to gun shows, which, you know, again, is legal in our country. You can resell a gun and like you don't have in some states, you don't have to do a deep background check on people. I believe in every state now, I think you have to do a background check, but I think there isn't like a cross state background check. So like if they don't have legal issues in that state, you can still still sell them the gun. So a lot of people um, have very hot takes on him going to gun shows and being like a secondhand gun dealer. Um, And I actually, and I I know your audience is much smarter than I am when it comes to this. I I actually believe there probably are states where you don't even have to still do a background check. So um, people have issues with that. Well, definitely I can understand the issues, but I still just don't understand the the simple logistics of how do you feed four wives and 18 kids and have all these big houses. I just don't get it. But well, they make all their money now off cameo. So they've made they've all made a lot of money. And now, you know, sister the wives kids are working for the money too. And the kids are all grown and they talk about on the first couple of seasons of the show, because I've I became a new fan probably three years ago, but then I've gone back and watched the seasons Mm. and they talk about the first couple of seasons. They have like no money. They had all they could do to feed the kids, to make their bill payments. And the wives worked, you know, Janelle uh, Janelle always worked in accounting. Christine was the stay at home mom. Robin never worked, Um, but Janelle always worked. And Mary ends up she worked for several seasons and now it takes over her um, mom's bed and breakfast. And they all now sell, um, well, a lot of people have controversy with this, but they all sell multi-level marketing items. So Uh, they have like a Plexus tea, which is the famous pink tea. And they, they claim it is not about weight loss. It's about gut health. Um, And Janelle, this was an exclusive on the Sarah Fraser show. I, I had listeners write to me, Janelle has a coaching motivational coaching company, and she just went back to work and is seeing clients again. So, um, that was fan you know, listeners that, that brought that up. So yeah, they do. I think now they have a lot more money and they're 18 seasons in. So they certainly are probably some of the highest paid talent on TLC. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Well, we wish them the best of luck. I mean, it's obviously we can't, even, it's yeah. terrible what's happened to them with the, with the child. And I'm sure they're all taking it poorly, but I, I know that um, I saw, I think on your feed that Janelle had gone back to work now and Uh, which is, by the way, always important, I think, when you've had such a tragedy in your life to kind of get back to normalcy and to be working. So good for her. Look, I'm sure all of them want to, you know, and and if we've all lost people that we were so close to, whether it's friends or a sibling, you know, I'm sure they want to crawl into a ball. But I mean, we all know, like, you have two choices in life every day, right? You can just get up and make the best of what's happened and move forward and honor that person. Or yeah, you can let it consume you. And I think it's great. You know, she, she, hopefully she can find purpose and they can find great ways to honor Garrison. And, oh, it's, it's so hard. And I think why so many people have very hot and opinionated feelings about this, because a lot of people feel like we shouldn't even talk about the sister wives family right now. And I think it's because TLC, unlike Bravo, there's no glitz and glam. It's really the way they film it is coming in as a fly on the wall into people's homes. And I think when you do that, there's this more, there's this less, they're a celebrity and more they're like our neighbor. Mm, That's a really good point. Yeah. Yeah. People feel very protective. I think of a lot of TLC people versus Bravo. They feel like all these women, and I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but I think that's the perception. A lot of people feel, well, these Bravo women want it. They want, they want the fame. They want to be in the limelight. They're fame hungry. And so let's have less empathy for them and more for these people that were just kind of watching their lives unfold. Right, right. 
Well, I'm so glad that you joined me here today. I don't want to take too much of your time up anymore, but you know, I think it's obviously going to be evident to my listeners if they haven't found you before, now that they found you, they're going to go listen to you because what you offer is so interesting. You have such good takes. You're so knowledgeable on everything. Um, and I cannot wait to hear more about your um, classes that you're, oh, you're taking it. I was you just telling you before we you started be about how, you know, even though again, as people have been listening to my podcast and think I've been doing it a long time. I really haven't. I just interviewed Megan King yesterday and the whole thing fell apart. My computer died. I had to finish the episode on my phone. It and then the same thing happened. It was a technical difficulty thing, but it happened when I was interviewing Melissa Rivers and I thought I was going to die because she, I was so excited that she agreed to do my show. And then like the last five minutes, I'm like, oh, I see something blinking on my computer and the whole thing died. And I was like, oh, how amateur of me, you know, so all of us have something that's terrible that's happened. I would love to, you know, share that in a, in a meeting with the, with all of our friends about the worst things that have happened. But anyway, and I know, you know, and by the way, you're still on David's podcast. Um, you guys share, what, what do you guys do with each other? So people we can do find you there too. A pod swap. And I, I'll talk about this too, when you come on the course, because our pod swaps worth it. We'll, we'll do a deep dive into that. But, um, okay. We do every week, we do two episodes together and we simultaneously release them on the Sarah Fraser show or behind the velvet rope. You can get it either place and it's all Bravo. So most of the time I just talk to whoever I damn well please and talk about TLC stuff in my own life. But two days a week we team up and we do deep dives into the Bravo gossip of the week. Yeah. And it's so good because then you can hear everything and you guys have such good chemistry together too. So <clears throat> yeah. Come on. We get on, David's a trip, but we get on well. Yes, yes. Um, okay, so tell people where they can find you and learn more about you and, and listen to your podcast. Yes, the podcast is The Sarah Fraser Show. You can get it everywhere you get your podcast. So whether that's Spotify, iHeartRadio, Apple, I put a new episode up daily so you can get something every single day. I'm also The Sarah Fraser Show on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, everywhere you get your socials. Perfect. Thank you so much, Sarah. I can't wait to talk to you again soon. You got it. Thanks. Thank you so much for listening to Misunderstood. I'm your host, Rachel Yucatel. Please be sure to subscribe to the show and give us a five-star rating and review. You can support the show by joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash misunderstood with Rachel Yucatel. Do you have ideas for the show or want to reach out? Email us at info misunderstood podcast at gmail.com. That's spelled M-I-S-S -S, understood. Thank you so much and I'll see you next time. Misunderstood.